Hello, and welcome to another edition of Wave Lab Workflows. My name is Justin Perkins. Thanks for tuning in, or thanks for watching this later, if that's what you're doing. Today's going to be kind of a long one, so I want to get right into it. But basically, I'm going to revisit how I approach mastering um, an EP or an album in the audio montage of Wave Lab. Because, you know, you can... And you can also do singles. A lot of this will apply to singles, but you know, EPs and albums are really a great thing to do in the Wave Lab montage. And I think some of these things you'll be able to take away and apply to your own workflow or copy it or however you want to do it, take away some bits and pieces. But I'm going to just show you how I do it because I get a lot of questions about it. And I did one last year, but we have some uh, new features in Wave Lab 11, such as reference tracks. And just a couple new options and things that um, I thought it'd be good to revisit and do another one. So I'm just going to check a few questions. So yeah, um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. At the end, I'll also be answering some questions. And if you go to WaveLab Users Group on Facebook, um, that's another great place to answer questions or ask questions and we'll answer you. Um, and also WaveLab Help dot com is where um, all these videos live and you can also download all my presets um, settings and things like that to help you get started and just work a little more faster and efficiently um, in wave lab um, well for whatever you're mastering an ep or an album and again even singles i did a single song video Last year as well, I'm going to redo that as well. So let's just get right into it. As you can see, I have a very rigid um, file structure, which you may not think is related to WaveLab, but it really is because if if you lay out your folder structure in this way, there's things that are much easier to do in WaveLab. You'll see in some of the menus as far as saving, rendering, things like that. So you don't have to do it this way, but this is why I have it set up this way. And it might make sense to you further down the line as I get into it. So I basically have a folder for the artist name, which is going to be called the Wave Labs. And days like these will be the EP name. And I have a folder for the original files. And if you want to go back and watch some of the other videos about settings and basic stuff, that might be good too if you're new to Wave Lab. But as I've mentioned... WaveLab doesn't make a copy of these files when you load them into an audio montage. It's just referencing these files. So it's really important to have your files, um, file structure and folder structure nicely organized before you get started. Because if you start dragging stuff in from your downloads folder and your desktop and your Dropbox and all this stuff, you're going to have a mess on your hands um, that you may not be aware of until you go to archive the project or pull it up on a different computer. So it's really important to be organized before you even get started. So again, artist name, release title is how I like to do it. Original files is the original files the artist sent me. I purposely picked these files because this mix engineer sent me a version of the mix um, without any limiting on it and his version of the mixes with limiting, which is very common these days to get um, both versions. And of course, I'm, I'm going to master from the non-limited versions, but I am going to load in the limited ones to a reference track and, and compare. So that's why I picked this one. I personally, so these files came in at, um, well, the, the mix, the unmastered mixes came in at 48K sample rate. And his limited ones are reduced down to 16-bit 44 one. That doesn't really matter. I'm just mentioning this because I like to upsample before I get started. I'm going to try to stick to facts here, but this is a little bit um, personal choice. I like to upsample everything to 96K before I start mastering. You don't have to do this. I just t I think it tends to sound better in the end to work in a high resolution environment. So if something comes in at 88.2 two point, uh, sorry. I'm totally having a brain fart, but if something comes at 88.2, um, I'll work there. If something comes in at 192, I'll work there. But if something comes in at 48K or 44.1, I will upsample the 96 before I get started. And that's why you have this folder of SRC files. It stands for sample rate converted. So let's get WaveLab opened up here. 
And again, I always work in the audio montage, even for singles. Um, you know, the, the audio editor is sometimes feels more direct, but it's also more limiting. And I don't care for that. You can watch some of the other videos. But why? But the audio editor does not work for me for mastering anything. It's more for listening. So the first thing we want to do is make an audio montage. I have a shortcut to create a default template. For me, if you're using my settings, it's just control and the number nine. Um, this opens up my preferred audio montage for mastering albums and EPs. And again, this goes a lot quicker when I'm not explaining it. So I could get, I could probably, if I wasn't talking, I could probably show you everything in less than 10 minutes, but we're going to explain it all go a little slower. Um, you can also press this button to create a new audio montage. The reason I do it from a template is because it's the right sample rate that I want, 96 kilohertz, which it shows you down there. It has my metadata preset loaded, which means after I correctly get everything named and entered in the data, I just have to do that one time and it goes to all my, um, what would you call it? Variations of the montage for different sample rates, uh, instrumentals, all this kind of stuff. So my template has the metadata preset loaded. Um, you can look at your templates if you go to file, new, audio montage, you can see I have a, a number of templates here and you can right click to set it as a default or to find a shortcut. So if you don't like my template, you can always just make an empty montage, get it how you want it. You know, I have some things set up like the CD wizard is set to my preferred settings, which we'll get to. Get everything set how you want it and then um, save that as a template. Um, as far as the better maker, no, there's no way to automate the better maker plugin to, um, disable, like we've talked about in other programs. So that's a limitation of their plugin. Um, WaveLab 11 does have plugin parameter automation now for clips, but, um, that's a whole different topic. So I've got my default montage here and I'm not a fan of dragging and dropping, uh, for, to me, that's just kind of sloppy and the windows, you got to play with the window sizes. So if you're using my settings, it's just command I to bring up a window that lets you pick the files you want to load in. If you're using the stock preferences of WaveLab, it's shift command I. Um, and there's other ways to do it. You know, you can go to file, you know, you can go to insert audio file. There's a number of ways to do it, but I just like to use the shortcut because I do this. this is the first thing I do. It's kind of just muscle memory. And I'm going to pick the upsampled versions, you know, to 96K, and I'm not going to pick the limiter version. So I'm just going to pick the, it's five song EP I picked to do. Pick the five songs that are part of this EP. And before they're inserted, a little menu pops up. And some people don't realize this, but you can arrange the song order right in this menu to kind of get you started. Now, usually I have this information in my Project Manager app, but today I just made a little note for the sake of this demonstration. So the order of the songs, you can do it. Um, if you hold Command and use the up and down arrow, that will actually move the song in order. And if you just use the up and down arrow, it selects it. So this is very quick to just determine the order of the songs. So I've just done that. It's especially when you have an album, it's a little more noticeable how fast it is to just use the arrows to select and use command and arrow to actually move it in order. Um, this is going to be an in the box mastering project. So none of the files are going to have metadata, although you can press a button to sort it by the track number metadata. If you have that, that's a somewhat new feature. As far as other features or options in wave lab, um, WaveLab, the montage can, of course, have a number of audio tracks, and I'm not talking about CD tracks. We're talking about actual audio tracks. Um, and as of WaveLab 11, we now have lanes, which are, allows you to have, you know, different lanes or sort of like playlists or just different paths on, on a single track. So what I like to do when I'm mastering an EP or an album is use a single audio track with lanes and I like it to stagger on two alternating lanes. Now, I used to do it with tracks because there were no lanes. This is the same concept, but by using just a single track, it's just a little cleaner. 
a little easier to manage. So this is kind of my um, preferred options to get the, the songs in the uh, montage. So I'm going to press OK. And now they're in the correct order. Um, the very first thing I do is save the montage. So right now you can see that red mark it means it's not saved. Command S will bring up this box. Um, now there is an option in the preferences to use the built-in Mac menu system when you are working, because I don't care for the file. Um, let me cancel this. I don't really care for this file section. It's hard for me to get my head around. It's very busy. I like the option where you just press Command S and the normal Mac or Windows um, save dialog pops up. So this is where the uh, one of the reasons where the f uh, folder structure comes in handy, the way I do it. Because I'm going to name this montage a certain way. I'm going to name it the band name or artist name. I like to little, put a little space and a dash. Then I like to put the, the release title. And then I have a little app that lets me paste text very easily with shortcuts. And that just pastes that text. That just means that it's... 64-bit floating point, 96K montage. It's the digital master as opposed to vinyl or cassette or instrumental, you know. And the little underscore just indicates to me that it's the master montage with all the plugins, which will make a little more sense later. And as you can see, it's already set to save the montage in the same folder that the files came from, which is another reason to stay organized before you even open WaveLab is get your files in a in a single folder um, so I don't have to do anything like I said I, I can do that in about three seconds um, without even thinking about it and I just press save and now the montage is saved um, and if we go to this folder where's my file browser if we go to this folder now we can see this green montage file this is going to save all our settings that I'm doing um, and that's going to be kind of our master File. Now, the reason I mentioned that little dash is because the way I work, I do end up with derivative montages of lower sample rates when all the processing is baked in. So you can see ones that don't have an underscore. The underscore just helps me quickly find in a list, which is the master one. And I call it version one because this is version one. If I was going to make any kind of revision at all, I would save as and go version two because you always want to be able to get back to version one. Because uh, a client may say, can we split the difference on that change or I actually liked what you did on version one? If you don't have an exact copy of that, it can be a problem. So I always do a new version anytime I make any kind of changes. And I never put dates in the title because to me, dates are useless in mastering because um, we're working on many projects per day. Sometimes I may send out two or three versions of a master in a given day. So dates are kind of useless. The files have date stamps anyways. Um, so I just stick with version numbers. It's just a personal preference of mine to just do version one, two, three. It's so much simpler than anything else in my opinion. Um, and then, you know, sometimes the client prefers version one. It's very easy to get that back to, get back to that and you don't have to think about which one from this day is it. So there we go. We have the montage saved. Now we can kind of get to work. Now, if I was mastering with analog gear, which I do sometimes, uh, my captures from analog would already be nicely trimmed, have 200 milliseconds of digital silence at the start, um, which is helpful because then when WaveLab drops the track markers for each song, there's a nice little buffer of digital silence between the start of the track and the first note or downbeat. Um, this is going to be more of an in-the-box kind of mastering approach, so we have to do all the trimming um, ourselves and then offset the track markers. So what the first thing I like to do, um, well, before I talk about that, you'll notice that we just have track one here. There's only one track in the session, and we have lanes. Now, you could do this all on one track and one lane. The reason I like to use lanes is because, maybe just me, but I get a fair amount of projects where songs overlap a little bit. You know, the client wants the next song to start while the previous song is still ringing out and doing it with lanes just sets you up um, to be able to do that quickly by overlapping. Now you can always convert, you can always add lanes and rearrange things. But for me, this is a good balance of seeing the waveforms nice and big, but also having two lanes for, you know, editing flexibility and things like that. So 
let me, the first thing I like to do is just trim up the files. Um, I use shift and the scroll wheel to zoom in on the waveform and um, see, just kind of see what's going on. You know, there's some just noise here. I'm not going to play any audio because I don't have permission. And again, this is not teaching really how to do mastering. It's how to, uh, you know, if you already understand mastering, how to do it in WaveLab. So, um, you know, I would listen to this and decide what that noise is. But basically, let's say I wanted to trim it there. Do a little fade in on the, the start so there's no ticker pop. I like to make it, again, so the first, this is a gray area because there's some rustling, but, you know, basically I like the first note to be around 200 milliseconds, which you can see on the timeline. Um, then I would listen to the end of the song and decide, you know, does this need to be shortened up, that last note, or is it hanging on too long? Um, it's very easy to quickly trim and add fades. I like to get this work out of the way right away because it's not the most fun part, but it also helps you get familiar with the material sometimes uh, as you're cleaning up. Um, so again, just listening. I'm going to be a little bit quick and sloppy here because uh, for the sake of this video and time, but I don't think I need to explain trimming too much. Um, I think we all understand that. But I do think it's a good idea to make sure your heads and tails are clean. Now, let's say I purposely did this. Let's say the client wants um, these two songs to kind of overlap a little bit. Um, I do that right away. And I also do this without any regard to the track markers yet. We're going to insert track markers in the near future here. But step one is I only care how does it sound when you play it. Like if you're playing a vinyl record or a CD. Um, I don't care about streaming right now. I just want to... How is it supposed to sound? Sometimes clients will give you a MP3 example of how they want the transition. That's where reference tracks can come in really handy, and I'll show you that. But let's just say they sent me a note that said, we want songs three and four to overlap a little bit. Um, and use your judgment. So I would listen and say, okay, that's uh, that sounds good. Now, you'll, you'll notice that when I move a file, all the other ones to the right move with it, which is very handy for mastering because if the client says, can you increase the space between songs two and three? All you have to do is move song three and the relationship of the others stay the same. That's called ripple mode. You can find it right here in the edit tab. You can have ripple mode be global. So that would be for all tracks. You can have ripple mode be just for a single track, a certain track, or you can have it off. Um, I had it on by default. I'm going to um, turn it off for a second. And there's a shortcut for this to turn it off. I'm going to turn it off for a second because I want to trim the end of this file. Um, I need to turn it to none. I want to trim the end of this file a bit so that, you know, it ends cleanly. And then I also want the beginning of this to be clean. So we're going to overlap these two songs. And I'm going to show you the rendering practices involved to make sure that when you make the final masters, that there's no glitch or tick or pop or hiccup at this transition point. It's going to be sample perfect so that it plays as smooth as possible on streaming, which is a bit of a challenge. And of course, is as smooth as possible on the CD master, vinyl, um, all the other stuff. Um, so let's just say I love how that transition sounds. Um, the song is kind of the last chord is ringing out and then the next one kicks in. We'll deal with the track markers later. But first step is just care how it sounds. Um, so we'll trim this one up. And this is some talking. Again, if they want the talking, leave it. But I'm just doing a quick um, rough assumption that they don't want any talking. So I'm just listening and saying, okay, you know. You now the CD, there are ways to just put d two seconds between the songs or the files. But... I don't think that works very well because every song has a different tail or sustain or ending, and I think it's important to listen um, and decide how close the song should be. Now, let me just talk about this now. I should have prepared one. I didn't. But sometimes a client will send you a full... Well, let me just... I'm just going to make one real quick. Sometimes clients will send you an MP3. Oh, let's put it on the desktop. So... Don't pay attention to this. Um, sometimes clients will send you a full wave or MP3 of the entire 
album of how they want all the songs to be sequenced. I get this not all the time, but often enough. If someone has a really precise idea of how they want it, they might say it can be an MP3. It doesn't matter how it sounds. It's more about being a reference point. So you can make a reference track in WaveLab by pressing this button and choosing reference track or using my shortcut. And now this we have a special track here with the R. And I, I, I did a whole video on reference tracks. So if you really want to deep dive on that, watch that video. But a reference track is basically a special type of track in the project that doesn't pass through the master section or any plugin processing. So you can compare the sound of what you're doing to an existing song file. Um, and the best part is there's no danger of this being in the playback or rendering path. You, you can only play one or the other. So, you know, in a normal Pro Tools or Cubase, if you had two files like I have now, you'd be hearing them both at the same time and it'd be super loud. Not good. The reference track, right now I would be hearing the, the normal audio on the blue green track. And if I solo with the ear, now I'm hearing the reference track. It's one or the other. But anyways, my point is, you, if your client gave you a file of how they want the sequencing, you can put it on a reference track, and then you can kind of zoom in. And I've already, I, I created it from this file, so it's kind of ruining the point here. But you can obviously zoom in and down to the sample and line up, you know, the versions you're going to master with their reference point uh, very easily. Um, and then, you know, you can keep this in your session for... Audio reference. I'm going to delete it. I just wanted to show you that real quick. A uh, reference track for sequencing um, does happen quite a bit. So now I've got the songs in the correct order. I've got the spacing, um, how it sounds good, um, fades, things like that. Now we can always adjust them later. If someone says, you know, song one rings out too long, can we start song two a little sooner? You can do that. I would, of course, save as. If I got that revision request after sending out version one, I would save as and make it version two. My point is we can still, none of these edits are destructive. This is all a non-destructive environment. But let's say we're happy with that. Um, the next thing I do typically is, let me read this question. I'll talk about, well, I did a whole, ep I did a whole video on using analog gear and wave lab. So you can watch that. Um, I like to break it up into two processes. Really. I like to do all the analog work, get all the songs on the same page, um, without any limiting, just kind of sounding good. And then I bring them into a new session, kind of like this, actually exactly like this and then finish it off. So I do it in two parts. I don't do it in one go cause, um, it's just, for me, it's too much to do. And, doing it in two steps opens up so much more flexibility for making the vinyl master revisions. So I do it in two parts. So if you're worried about analog gear, watch that video. And then once you get done with the analog processing and you're going to finish it up with some limiting and maybe some little touches, this is the same process I would do. The only difference being that the files would already be trimmed up uh, more nicely and things like that with a little bit of uh, digital silence at the start. So I don't have to do what I'm about to show you, but let's say I'm happy with this. The next thing I like to do is use the, what's called the meta normalizer in WaveLab. And again, this is also non-destructive. If you go to the clips tab, you'll see that there's two gain settings. One is pre-gain and one is post. And as of now, they haven't been changed. Pre-gain just means you're changing the gain before any clip effects, which I'll get to effects in a minute. Post gain would mean you're changing the gain after the clip effects, but before the track and montage effects. It'll make more sense in a minute. Right now, everything's set to zero. You can, of course, drag the volume line up and down, but I like to reserve that for just sort of like micro automation. You know, if, if a part needs to be a little louder, a little quieter, I tend to keep the volume line at zero. And you just, like I said, use that for little micro automations. Um, but what I like to do is use the meta normalizer, which is, you know, I use so many shortcuts for this stuff. So sometimes I forget which menu it's in, but in the process tab, we have the meta normalizer. Um, for me, it's just shift in the letter M for meta normalizer. Um, these are the settings I use. So you may want to pause it and look, um, this is just something I made up that works for me. You know, you know, there's no magic or secret to this, um, but what it's doing is it's it's going to change non-destructively change the level of each song 
and not to the same av- not to the same integrated loudness. So if a quick thing about LUFS, you know, we have integrated LUFS, which is the entire song. We have short term and momentary. I like to essentially normalize each song to the same short term maximum LUFS. And what that does is it makes it so the loudest part of each song is the same. So like the third chorus, um, it just helps get all the songs on the same page um, as far as, you know, any processing that's going to occur. Um, it's honestly, I, I wouldn't call it cheating, but it just makes your life so much easier. I, I see people that are out constantly fighting the, you know, the level of the mixes they're given. And you can do that, but it saves so much time and um, creates confidence and, and consistency if you start from the same uh, loudness. Now, if you get something to master that's super crushed and limited, then you probably just leave that and just do your very minor touches. But when you got all the unmastered mixes with no limiting, um, you know, these are pretty close, but sometimes you get stuff that's all over the place where one song's way quieter than the others. So again, this is going to... Um, this is going to non-destructively normalize all the songs to the same sh- um, maximum short-term loudness. Now, there's one catch. There is an actual setting for maximum short-term loudness. There's a setting for loudness of an entire clip, and I don't want that. I don't want each song to have the same integrated loudness, because if a song starts from quiet and gets loud, that's not going to really make sense to the ear. Um, I don't. I don't like integrated for this particular step. Um, maximum short-term loudness is great, but one better is a feature that's special to WaveLab. I'm not even sure exactly what it does, but it's more musical to my ear, the top of loudness range. So basically the top of the loudness range, it's very similar to maximum short-term LUFS, but it's even better. I use that setting, and I use minus 16. Just I've just picked that one day, and I built a plug-in chain around that so that when I insert kind of my go-to plug-in chain, everything's set flat. You know, I don't have EQs going, but I have it set in such a way where the threshold of a compressor is almost ready to engage, and the makeup gain is such that when I insert a limiter with a few decibels of, um, you know, the threshold increased by a couple decibels, that I'm pretty much in the ballpark of where I like to be, and then I, of course, fine-tune it by ear. But this saves you a lot of time and promotes consistency. So enough talking about it. There's the settings. Um, You can do it just on selected clips. You can do it um, uh, post-gain, but I I like to do pre-gain, and then I just hit apply. Now watch the files change level. I'll undo that. That's how they were. This is how they are. And you'll notice that in the clip section it changed the gain by a little bit each song you know first two songs it turned it down a little bit third and fourth song turned down a little more and the last song it turned it up a little bit and of course i'm going to check this by ear but this gets you 99 percent there as far as the songs feeling the same level you know if i just hit play at the start and listen to this without doing any other changes um, i would probably not feel the urge to adjust my listening level it's going to sound pretty musical uh, because again the loudest part of each song is set to the same level now the climax the peak of each song and not the i shouldn't have said peak you know the the biggest moments of each song is going to be hitting the same level now this doesn't really compensate um, i know because i've already mastered this project the last song is more of an acoustic song so um even though it's measuring the same level as the first rock song to my ears. That's going to sound a little bit unnatural. So I'm going to also fine tune this by ear. No. And so the first thing I do is then just listen and say, did that work out? And again, it's usually 99% there, but as I'm listening through, if this song just feels too loud, because it's an acoustic song compared to all the rock songs, I can, you know, turn it down two decibels until it feels right. Uh, I like to use this area, again, before grabbing the the volume line, because this only has so much swing, uh, whereas this has everything. Again, this is all non-destructive, so it hasn't made any new files. So it's a really clean way to do it. You know, some people normalize their files before they start, but they're making copies, and then you're getting into dithering, um, cans of worms. Um, This is all just happening non-destructively, floating point. It's very clean.
So let's say I'm happy with how this sounds uh, just from a pure level standpoint. Um, I'm jumping around a little bit here, but um, you kind of have two choices. I could do the track markers. In fact, sometimes I actually do, sometimes I'll do the track markers before I do the step I just showed you. It doesn't matter too much, but let's just do the track markers now. So another big part of mastering that people don't think of is entering the track markers, the titles, names, and things like that. And the great thing about WaveLab is you really just have to do that once and all your other masters are, um, it carries over to any other formats, any other revisions, any other downsampled, you just do it one time. So WaveLab has the CD wizard and usually something with wizard in the title sounds like something you wouldn't want to use because it um, is trying to be good and it's not, but the CD wizard is actually very good. Um, I use the shortcut for it, but you find it in the CD tab under functions. I have it programmed to be control C um, and it pulls up this menu. And these are the settings I use. You may want to pause and take a screenshot, but what I'm using is um, of course, CD track markers. The really important thing here is to use splice markers, because if you don't, you're going to get an end marker and then a start marker for each song. And then you got to manage the end and the start. Whereas if you use a splice marker, these are glued together and it's much easier to manage. You know, it's more black and white. One song ends, the next one starts. There's none of this gray area, which can be a problem when you're rendering. Cause if you, if you don't use a splice marker and there's space between your end and your next start marker, when you, when you go to render, you could be omitting that space. And now there's not as much time between your songs as you expected. Um, so these, these are the settings I use. I don't have it name any markers. I don't have it change any gaps. I just have it um, do that and I quantize to the nearest marker. Um, I could enter the ISRC codes now. So if I go back to my notes, I could copy the first code, check that box, paste it in. I could also do the UPC if you have it. Some people don't get it till later, but it's a 12 digit code in the US. We have to pr type in a zero and then paste in the 12 digits because we don't have 13. So this is how I use the CD wizard. Um, but let me back up a step because I also have a stream deck and you can download my stream deck profiles, but I can do that even faster. So let's forget all that said. I can press this button on the stream deck um, and it, uh, let me just start over. I pressed the wrong button. Stream deck for the CD wizard. See how fast that is. So this is how it was pressing the stream deck. And what that's basically doing is calling up the CD wizard. My settings are there because of the pre the montage preset and then it's just hitting apply for me. So it happens very quickly. Um, that's how fast that happens. Now you'll notice we have some cleanup work to do because um, this is in the box project. It basically puts the markers at the start of each um, clip plus quantize to the nearest CD frame. Um, this is not ideal because uh, for one we want our first marker to be right at zero so the timeline is correct and in the case of track two we don't want at least me personally i don't want the marker to be so close to the downbeat um, and then that overlap one we'll have to deal with manually um, so there is a nice feature called move multiple markers and again this all once you get the hang of it this is so quick but you go to markers function move multiple markers Again, I have a preset to bring in this box up so it's even faster. I basically have two presets in this area. One is, the only difference is one doesn't quantize to CD frames, which comes in handy for singles and other things. But what this is gonna do is it's gonna move every marker backwards by 200 milliseconds and quantize it to a CD frame. Um, and even if you're not making CDs or, or the client isn't, I still prefer to quantize because you never know if someone's gonna a, decide to press CDs, B, burn a CD. Um, and if you don't quantize your markers and then you go to make a DDP or a CD, the marker can shift by a few milliseconds. And sometimes, most times that's probably not noticeable, but if you have overlapping audio and things like that, you kind of want to know where your markers are going to land. So um, these are the settings I use. And if you want to watch the marker times in the marker window, they're going to shift by 200 milliseconds. So if I go to the start of the... Um, and if it doesn't, you know, there, there, there was less than 200 milliseconds here, but it just pushes it to zero if there's not enough time, which is fine. Because when I hit play, that's what we get. 
Um, now, for some classical releases, I might do closer to half second or a full second before the first note, but this is more of a rock thing. For me, 200 milliseconds works, but you can play with that and decide how much time you want before the first downbeat kicks in. And now if we skip to the other markers, you'll see there's a little bit of a, you know, these songs were so close together that um, the marker, this is probably inaudible and not even worth talking about, but let's say we turn ripple off and that's where you decided if you move the marker closer to the downbeat or if you move the songs further apart. Um, but I'm just checking my markers. Now you saw that song that overlaps Usually when there's overlapping songs, WaveLab does not put the marker in a great spot at all. You have to drag this over. And I know I talked about having 200 milliseconds before each song starts. Well, when you have overlapping audio, you, that, that rule does not apply because um, either way, this transition is going to be a little awkward when you skip to that song. It's going to be abrupt because it's cutting in the middle of audio. Um, you wouldn't want to have 200 milliseconds of the previous song. And then that, if it's going to be awkward, you might as well just have it be right on the downbeat. Um, that's my personal view about it. You can try to do a zero crossing, but just remember that what's a zero crossing now is probably not going to be once there's, uh, you know, plugins and stuff applied. So it's kind of trivial. Um, but again, you just decide where you want that transition point to be. I've had clients that, you know, they want, they think they want overlapping songs and then they realize you can't have it both ways. You can't have a totally clean start to this song here uh, and have them overlap because you're going to hear the final sustain of the previous song. You know, I've, I've had to make special single versions of songs that don't have any overlap. But for the album, you're never going to have it both ways. You're going to either you're going to hear the last little bit of that song and that's just the way it is but a lot of classic albums are like that you know it's you know you can't have it both ways you get one or the other and again you know i just listen to it and make sure the transition sounds how i want and then decide where the track marker should be you know i can play with it a little bit um that one's fine and then the end you know you kind of you still want to listen to the very end and make sure I've had people that want a little more breath at the end, you know, if it's an, an abrupt ending, you know, you may want a half second of silence before the, the album ends. But once you've kind of fixed up where the marker placements are, you can go back to the CD wizard and I have an option that just says quantize only. So it's not going to make new markers. It's only going to quantize the existing markers to a CD frame. And this is also, I didn't actually, add the codes but this is where you could add the first isrc and add the upc you can always do this later with in fact i have presets for isrc only that unchecks all the boxes except isrc so now's a good time to do that put in the codes why not so that is uh about cd markers we're not quite done though because you'll notice the CD markers took on the same name as the audio files, which again, if I'm doing analog work, I name the files the exact song title. So there's, I don't have to rename them in this stage. If you're doing in the box, like I am, the track markers are going to take on the name of whatever the files were. So this is how the mix engineer labeled them. I added the dash, the underscore 96 K cause I upsampled. This is the time and place to clean up these titles. And you don't want to do it in the clips tab because in my opinion, you always want the clips to have their original name so you know if it's mix version three, mix version four. Um, I never change the name of the clips. What I change is the marker names. So again, I usually get it from my project manager app, but I'll, I just have a Apple Notes right now. Um, this is the only time you'll have to paste or deal with the song titles for the rest of the project. And it's very quick. Just copy and paste them in. So again, rename the markers so they're clean. Um, don't rename the clips. Um, so now I've got the correct song titles, and that looks better. Um, the next thing I take care of is the CD text. And you're probably saying, I don't make CDs anymore. Why do I care about CD text? It's a waste of time. Well... It's not a waste of time because the way WaveLab works, the CD text is how you push titles to metadata and also some file naming things. So 
I don't even think about it as CD text. I just think of it as the window where I have to make sure it's filled in. It's very quick to do. And again, this is part of why I name my montage the way I do. I have a, uh, I have a stream deck, so you'll see how fast this is. But what the stream deck is going to do is copy the name of the montage. It's going to copy this, this whole thing. Then it's going to bring up the CD text editor, and then it's going to paste that into the first line, all in, one, all in the press of a button. Now, I don't want it to say that, but this is a good starting point. So I'm going to clean up and have just the album title there, and then I'm going to paste it again and have just the artist name. Now, I have to get the artist name to every track. This is just for the album. This button pushes the artist name to every track in one click. And if I press page down or use the scroll bar, I'll get to track one. And if I press the arrow over on the right, in one click, it's going to take the marker names and enter them as the CD text name. So again, this is all very quick when I'm not talking about it, but you want to fill in that CD text editor. You can you can have different performer per song. So if this was the Wave Labs featuring Elvis, I, I'd have to put featuring. You could do that for a particular song. This would be the place to do it. Um, but for a lot of projects, it's the same for everything. You can you can enter in songwriter, composer, and make your own um, metadata presets for that to transpose over. But for most projects, this is all I enter is the um, these fields you're seeing, the top two fields. I'm gonna just delete Elvis on this one. So again, that's all very quickly done when I'm not talking about it. Um, the slow way would be to go to CD tab. CD text, edit CD text, brings up this box. It's all the same. I have a shortcut, which is Shift and T. Or again, with the Stream Deck, you can kind of combine actions and copy the name of your project because you're going to be using some of that text. So now we're getting pretty close to actually getting into the audio, um, but I like to get some of the administrative stuff taken care of first. So um, everything's clean and good to go. So the next thing I would do is I would listen to each song and decide what's the best song to start with. Because for those that don't know, in, in WaveLab, and my, my WaveLab looks a little different. I, I can show you the default layout. Um, not my favorite layout. But over here we have the master section, which I'm sure most people watching know that I don't use the master section. I keep it locked. I keep it zero. I keep um, no effects loaded. Let's see if... Yeah, Clarity M is still there. The only thing I use is the playback processing slots to feed my meter. I keep this all empty. I did a whole video on the master section if you want to watch that. Um, so we have the inspector and the master section. Master section, I just leave it empty. I don't, no plugins there because you have to save and load this separately and it's affecting anything you play through it. So not a great place, in my opinion, for plugins. The inspector is within the montage. Um, so we have clip effects, which are plugins you can put directly on each file as I'm selecting them here. Because if someone has like a sound clip or if it gets complicated, you can have many tracks, but um, in most cases I don't need them. But track effects would relate to the, so any plugins I put in the track section, all these files are gonna play through it the same. So I typically don't want that. And we have the output section, and that is something I do use. That's kind of where I sometimes put my final limiter and dithering, because that's after the clip and track effects. That's kind of like my master section, because I don't use the real master section. I prefer this layout, because it gives me more re screen real estate. Prior to WaveLab 10, your effects used to be up here, so I'm just used to them being up here. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's where I like to put my plug-in window um, just used to it there so I would pick a song to start with you know sometimes the first song of an EP or album is a strange one it's more of an intro piece um, or it's in a, a, a light song um, I like to just pick what song is the most representative of the full project combined with what is maybe the better mix kind of the benchmark to aim for for the rest of the songs um, a number of factors go into which song I start with um, working on first. So, um, again, I'm, I can't play any audio to you. I mean, I could, but I'm not going to. Let's just say song number two is the song I want to start with. Um, 
as you can see, uh, it's playing back around the integrated level of this playback is minus 18 LUFS, which I think is a great starting point for most plugins, you know, as far as gain staging. Now, again, the, the maximum loudness is going to be about minus 16 because that's what I set the normalizer to be. So the end is going to get up that loud. But I think, um, you know, most of the song is playing around minus 18. Um, it doesn't really matter. We can master as loud or quiet as you want. But my whole point here is um, I have a plug-in chain that I, I came up with. I'm not saying you have to use it. It's You can download it. Um, and it's not really, you know, there's no settings applied, so um, it's not really going to get you anywhere. You still have to use your ears and, and do your thing and use your judgment and experience. But my whole point is, you know, while you can just load, you know, you could start, you could do it slowly and say, okay, I want to add an EQ. So you could add your EQ and then listen to it and decide what you want to do. And then you can say, I want to add a, you know, a little saturation or compression you can do it one by one, but I, um, you can also save plug-in chains. So um, that's the save option. Here's kind of all my plug-in chains for various tasks with it within WaveLab. Some are designed to be for the master output. Some are designed for before I go analog. All sorts of stuff in here. But my whole point is you can save plug-in chains, chains, which saves you a little time. Um, I have a plugin chain. This it has kind of a lot of plugins, and I typically, um, it has just about. It's set up in such a way where it has any plugin I would probably want to use, and then I remove what I don't need. Um, but again, you know, I, when I load this, you'll see that uh, you know the EQ is set flat, but it's set to maybe some common points, and some other settings like natural phase are selected. Um, Again, this EQ is not actually doing anything, but it's ready to go to clean some low mids. Um, this plugin is actually engaged, but I can bypass it and decide I like this plugin a lot, but it's very subtle. Soothe is a great plugin and this deesser. Um, and again, this compressor, the threshold is set in such a way that it's just starting to do a little gain reduction, and that's because I've normalized it to the same. You know, it's very repeatable, and then I could, if I want it more gain reduction on the song it's it's ready to go if i want less so it's a it's a good starting point and speaking of starting points let me uh, let me go to a just empty project let's say you have some plugins you like to use and you can of course you can save a preset but as of wave lab 11 you can now save a default preset so that anytime you load this plugin it's going to be set to a certain way for you um, and some plugins have that built in but Many of them don't, and it's kind of annoying. So WaveLab has a feature that will let you um, define a good starting point when you just randomly load the plugin. Now, I showed you loading an effects chain, which again has a lot of plugins, and I tend to strip it down. Um, or maybe you know, want I need to add something that I only use once in a while. But basically, this is your clip effects chain. Um, so the plugins. That you're seeing here in the green clip area are only going to affect this song. Let me show you a plug. So you can see that as I'm playing song two, it's traveling through this plugin. If I play song one, it is not because I don't have any plugins inserted on this song yet. So, you know, what I might do is dial in the song. And again, I can't really teach mastering in such a short time, you know, uh, but you would use your ears and decide how you want it to sound uh, with EQ. Um, compression and limiting. Now you'll notice I didn't load a limiter and that's because to be honest a lot of times I like to use a single limiter for the entire project if I can. It doesn't always work out that way but um, you know I could add a limiter to the end of this clip effects chain that would just be for this song um, but a lot of, like I said I usually have stuff so dialed in at this stage where once I get every song sounding good on its own, a lot of times a global limiter will work. So I'll skip the track effects, but I may go to the montage output and load a certain plugin chain. I just picked one. Actually, this one's pretty extreme. Let me pick this one. You know, once you get all the songs on the same page, you know, the Oxford Inflator is a nice plugin for a little boost. A lot of people like this Fab Filter Limiter. Again, it's not doing much, but it has 
some of the settings I like, like the oversampling set to where I like it, the ceiling set to where I like it, and then I can, of course, increase it. And as, as I mentioned earlier, with, with the gain structure of my clips, the gain structure of my plug-in chain, and the gain structure of this master, you know, I'm, I would probably master it louder, but it's, it's in the ballpark of minus 9, minus 10. And I'm not saying you just use presets and don't listen, but it gets you very close once you kind of know your room and your workflow. It's, it can save you a lot of time to normalize to a certain level and have a bit of a fixed plug-in chain. I do the same thing with my analog gear. Before I go analog, I normalize everything to a certain level, so it's hitting my chain at a, a predictable and repeatable level and expected level. Um, for me, that's a lot easier. So... I have a limiter in the montage output, which is the red area. Now this is affecting everything. So I haven't worked on song one yet, but you can see that song one is traveling through this plug-in path. Song two is a lot louder because it has makeup gain on the compressor. So I would dial this, you know, my whole point was there's two ways to do it. You can do limiting per song, which for some projects, that's what I do. For other projects, if it's similar, I like to use the same limiter to kind of gives everything a similar gel and, and vibe and things like that. And then it's also easier when the client says, we love it, but can you make it louder? Well, then you only have to adjust one limiter and it's adjusting the entire project. You'll notice this is getting a little off track, but true peak limiting is kind of controversial. I think it doesn't sound as good. So I have it turned off, but I do like this fab or sorry, um, Tokyo Don, um, limiter 6GE, and you'll notice I have everything turned off except the true peak section set to the same ceiling. Sometimes I'll do mine as 0.3, depends on the project, but the cool thing about this is you can listen to the delta and you can hear just the true peaks that it's catching. So I don't think it's that true peak limiting sounds bad. It's just when you ask your limiter to do the heavy lifting and true peak limiting, you can hear artifacts where if you split it up into two tasks, you can really keep an eye on what the true peak limiter is doing and decide if you like it or want to ditch it. But you can kind of see it catching a few true peaks in delta mode and decide if you want that. Or if you don't care about true peaks, then don't care about them and delete it. But um, So anyways, let's say I love how this song sounds. I'm going to use a global... I'm going to attempt to use a global limiter. You know, global master section kind of deal on the whole EP because they're similar songs. I love how song number two sounds. Um, one thing, this is a total side note, but you'll see the space in the plug-in chain. If I just close the montage and reopen it, that space goes away. That's really the only way to clear it up. It's not a big deal to be there, but if you're kind of OCD, it might bother you. Let's say I love this plug-in chain. Um, I have a shortcut to do this very quickly, but you know, you, you could obviously the one way would be to start from scratch and maybe reload, um, reload this plugin chain as a starting point, or just kind of go one by one as just just what it needs if it's more delicate process. But you know, if it's a song, if it's an album that's like, um, you know, like a Ramones album where all the songs sound the same, and you want to have the same starting point. For the other songs, again, you're going to fine tune them because it could be a different keys, different tempos. Um, even with great mix engineers, you know, not every song, you know, some songs are still a little bright and you got to deal with that. But let's say you wanted this same plugin chain to be on the other f four songs. There's a fast way to do it, but the slow way is to um, copy all the effects. Um, there is a way to invert the selection Oop. inverse selection so it selects all the other songs and then you could go to back to the inspector and you could paste to selected clips and now all my plugins all those plugins are going to be on every clip and again we can individually when when you're talking about clip effects if I go to song one and change the EQ, it's only affecting song one because it's a clip effect. It's not affecting any other songs. The only plugins that are affecting all the songs equally are, is the montage output. And again, that comes after clip effects, that comes after track effects. 
It's the output effects. And all these plugins are saved within the montage. Part of why I don't care for the master section is because you have to go down here and save or load the master section separately. For me, it's just kind of a pain and a hassle to have to think about that as a separate item. So I just hide it. And the montage out is my master section. So I'm listening. You know, I'm, I'm mastering. I'm deciding, okay, this song feels like it's a little too bass heavy. I could, or maybe, okay, we'll say it's bass light because it looks like it actually is. I could boost some low end. I could introduce, again, I have a multi-band compressor. It's all bypassed. But it's ready to go if I want to use it. I could engage that just for this song. Do that kind of thing. I could say it's getting a little sibilant. Um, I could clamp down. That's obviously a lot. I could clamp down on the de -esser. Um Or I could say the compressor's not grabbing enough or too much. We can fine tune that. So clip effects. I think I made the point. Clip effects are per song on a per song basis. So... Um, Again, I can't teach mastering, but I can just teach you how to do what you hopefully are, are learning how to do or know how to do in terms of getting everything sounding the way that you want. Now, this happens a lot. So as I mentioned earlier in the video, the mix engineer was sending the artist mixes that had limiting already applied, which is totally normal these days and has been for a while. So at some point, well, there's two things I want to show you. Another thing I do, no matter what, whether I have the, sometimes obviously I just get the unmastered mixes and I go do my thing. Um, and then sometimes I get the reference limited versions. But even if I don't get the reference limited versions, um, I do like to use reference tracks to compare what I've done to how did it sound originally. So I have a shortcut of control option command R to make a reference track. And it's very easy to copy what I have going on here down to the reference track. But I obviously don't want to copy the clip effects because I want to hear just the raw natural audio as it came in without any changes. So you can right click on the track header, copy clips to track. And I'm going to choose track two, the reference track. That's the only other track in the session. And there are some options, but for my purposes here, I don't want to copy any of this. I want to copy all the clips. I don't want to copy the plugins because I want to hear it untouched. I don't want to copy any volume or panning, and I don't want to copy any gain. I just want to hear the untouched audio. So I'm going to press OK. And as you can see, it makes a copy of the original files. You can make this a little smaller if you want. Um, if you have, because I'm doing this video, my audio interface is set up very simple. So if you just have a simple audio interface with just two outputs, you just have to hear the ref to hear the original files on the reference track. You just have to press the ear button to listen to the original audio. If you have a more advanced audio interface and a monitor controller, you can actually route the reference track to say outputs three and four or five and six. So then on your monitor controller, you can toggle between, you know, what, what you're working on and toggle over to how it sounded originally um, on a monitor controller. So however you want to set that up, it's your preference, um, but it's designed to work in a simple setup or a complicated one if, if you have that kind of interface. But my whole point here is, you know, you can get, even if something sounds bad, you can get used to it or harsh. So as you're working, you may want to compare with um, how it originally sounded and say, oh, maybe I went too bright or maybe, or sometimes it's, you know, I hear a weird click or distortion. Um, this allows you to toggle the original f mix and see if, oh yeah, I can hear it in the original mix. We need to, we need to fix it. Um, things like that. Now there isn't any level matching yet with reference tracks. The master section has smart bypass, but since I'm not using it, it doesn't matter. Um, I have a little offset on my monitor controller so I can kind of rough in, you know, the, um, the mat, the level of the mastered audio compared to the unmastered audio. Cause it's obviously going to be different so that it, there's not such a jump in level. Um, so I just do that manually with my monitor controller. There isn't, 
but it's one of the most requested features. So I think in the near future here, we're going to see smart bypass, you know, some kind of level matching within the audio montage. So that should be happening soon. But for now, you have to manually deal with that offset. There's a plugin from Meter Plugs called Perception by Ian Shepard. That's also a good option um, if you're not already using it. For me, I just handle it manually. Um, you know, I've done enough projects where I just get around that without any issues. But that is how you can kind of AB with the original files versus what you're doing. But also I mentioned the, the mix engineer sent his limited versions that the uh, artist proved. You know, a lot of times the artist doesn't even hear the non-limited versions, which is kind of crazy, but it's how the world works these days. So the other thing I want to do is I can load in the mix engineer's limited versions and I have to put them in order. Again, it takes a minute. Not, it doesn't take a minute. It takes a few seconds. Hospice. And, you know, you do, I don't always do it perfectly, but this, in fact, I do it fairly sloppily when I'm doing this because my whole goal here is just to get them in sync. You know, I'm getting the limited versions in sync with my versions. And sometimes I don't even care if the crossfade is terrible. I just want to get the transients lined up so that when I switch over from what I'm doing to the reference versions that there's they're in sync and it doesn't have to be perfect um, unless you really want it to be. But usually some kind of transient to line it up to is enough to get it. So it would be nice if there was some kind of auto align. And maybe there even is, and I never found it, but it just takes a moment to get the reference versions synced up. Um, and again, since it's a reference track, I'm not hearing all three versions. I'm hearing only the top version that I'm working on. And then I can choose if I want to solo the loud limited version from the mix engineer, or if I want to solo the untouched unmastered mix or listen back to what I'm doing. So you can have multiple reference tracks in a, in a project here in a session. So, um, that is that. So that's another thing I do once I feel like I've gotten it to a point where I'm pretty happy with it. I like to just double check that, you know, I didn't make it worse and also get a feel for the loudness of the, the artists have been listening to it's you can deliver a master that's quieter than the reference version but it's often not a great idea because the artists get so used to it being super loud they wonder why why isn't the master version as loud so that's that can be a can of worms but this helps you very quickly um figure out if you're in the ballpark of uh or louder or where you're at compared to what they've been listening to and what you started with so reference tracks are good i'm going to Check the questions before we dive into the next phase here. Um, I don't use WaveLab for upsampling, although it would sound fine. I'm just such a creature of habit that I use, I still use RX. Um, WaveLab uses the SOX algorithm, sounds totally fine. I just have so busy mastering, I don't have time to get my brain around the batch. I would use the batch processor of WaveLab. And, you know, I just, it's one of those things where I just need to take a little bit of time and set up a preset and just understand. But um, I've been doing the upsampling practice since way before WaveLab had the SOX. And it didn't, WaveLab used to not have the greatest sample rate conversion. So anyways, you can do it. You just have to use the batch processor. Um, I did a whole video on the batch processor as well with uh, Ian Stewart. Uh, we talked about using the batch processor at WaveLab. So if you don't have, you know, your, your favorite sample rate converter, you, the one in WaveLab is totally adequate. I just need to learn it myself. I just don't have a workflow for it. Uh, you can, I'm going to answer a question about, let's say you do have a song open in the audio editor. So if you're not familiar with WaveLab, there's two main 
workspaces in Wave Lab. There's the audio editor, which is destructive, and there's the audio montage, which I've been working in, and it shows you what you're working in right here. And then, the, of course, there's the batch processor and some other little things, but there's two main areas. But let's say you have a file open in the audio editor. I believe it's Shift and T. Yeah, Shift and T. That might have been a custom thing I programmed, but that will create an audio montage from the audio file. And now you have an audio montage from that file. You, you just have to save it now. And, you know, the montage files are so small. It's really not... Um, the montage file I'm working with is 88 kilobytes, so we don't have to worry about them taking up space. Um, it's really not an issue. But that there is a way to open up a file from the audio editor and get it into montage. It'll, it'll use the same sample rate. Um, it won't do any trimming. You have to do all that yourself. I'm going to check out any other questions that might be re relevant. Uh, to zoom in and, well, I don't know if you mean, someone asked about zooming. Um, to zoom this way, I'm holding command and using the scroll wheel of the mouse. And to zoom vertically, I'm holding shift and using the scroll wheel of the mouse. So I toggle between command and shift a lot for zooming. And I guess I I do it pretty quickly, just doing it so long. Um, you can program zoom in and out on a key key command. I have R and T program, but as you can see, that's pretty slow. You can use these wheels over here, but for me, it takes time to find the wheel and deal with all that. So I just use shift and command and then the scroll wheel on my mouse. Should work on a trackpad too if you have a laptop. All right, so let's get back to it. So let's say I'm happy with how this sounds. I personally keep the reference tracks in there, but I'm gonna clean them. Under, just, just to make this cleaner, I'm gonna delete them. There's really no harm in keeping the reference tracks because again, there's no danger. The beauty of the reference track is there's no danger of them getting in part of the rendered audio. You know, if you had, again, if you had a Pro Tools session and you had two tracks next to each other, you'd have to remember to mute the reference track, otherwise it's gonna be in your bounce or render. Reference tracks are just a very safe way to work because there's no chance of it being um, part of your render. So I think I'm at a point here where I, let's say I'm happy with the sound. If anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to ask them, but I'm at a point now where I'm gonna describe the rendering process. Um, and it's a little bit, you might think it's a little bit overkill until I explain why I do it this way and um, it saves you time and headache in the long run, and it's really not a big deal. So um, make a try. I'm not forgetting anything, but yeah, I mean, you, you can double check. One thing I like to do is to double check. I'll talk about CD text, but I like to check the markers and make sure there's no empty spaces after the words, because if there's a blank space after the end of the word, that can cause a problem later on. So I like to use... I can see my, I like to put the cursor at the end of the title and just use page up and down and scroll through them and make sure that everything's tight and clean and you can do that with the artist name. But if the first one is right, the rest should be. Um, one side note about CD text and metadata. This is something, something I started doing recently. CD text is limited to these ASCII characters. So that means you can't have accents or special characters in the CD text. You can have special characters in the metadata. So you can have, you can have accents and, um, you know, things that are outside of this basic character set. So one thing that I do, let's say a song did have an accent. Um, what I do is I keep the CD text names clean and simple. Cause this, our eventual file names for each song are going to be based off of actually the CD text because you also want to keep your file names simple. You don't want to have special characters in your file names because Windows in particular can have problems. So I like to keep the... F it kind of works out in that I I want to keep the... The CD text has to be basic because of the restriction of the format. And then 
you may as well apply that to your file names because you don't want to have any problems. But let's say we wanted a special character in the song title. Um, then I would go back and edit the marker name to have that special character. Let's say, uh, let's see if I can even do it. I should have had one ready to copy and paste, but I think if I type it like, oh, well, it's doing a shortcut. Well, my point is, if you have, if your song titles have special characters, you can have the marker names have special characters. You just want to fit, you want to simplify it in the CD text area before you do any rendering. And again, the, uh, you only have to enter in this data one time and then you're done. Um, everything else is going to carry over. So it's a little bit, it's not even that tedious. It's actually pretty fast, but do it once, do it early, forget about it. Um, so I'm going to render this audio and your first instinct may be to render each track one at a time because that's what you ultimately want, right? You want a WAV file of each song. But for reasons, and, and other people do this even before I was aware of it, we're going to render the whole montage as one long file. And you might think that's crazy, but you'll see why. Part of the reason is sometimes plugins um, have a hard time in the first few samples of the, uh, you know, the clip effects, for example. I've seen many plugins that struggle. So if you're rendering track by track with a lot of plugin processing or even a little bit of plugin processing, certain plugins will have a little glitch or hiccup at the start of it. Whereas if you render one long file, it can kind of look ahead and be prepared and you don't have any glitches. And then also it helps for overlapping um, audio because I can guarantee you if I tried to render track by track with heavy processing um, there's going to be a little glitch at this transition point because the audio is not going to be sample accurate so the first step is to render it as one full piece and that might be a good time to take questions because it's probably going to take a minute to render in fact let me normally I would keep some of these plugins but let me just dump a few of them to speed up the render And I'll turn uh, over sampling off to speed up the render. I want it to be somewhat accurate. Anyway, when I do this render, it might be a good time to take any questions, but let me get it started. Um, again, this is where your folder structures really help out, in my opinion, because I'm going to render this to a folder called 96K Renders. You don't have to name it exactly that, but this is, that's what I do. So this is going to be a single render of the entire record. So again, I, li I like that WaveLab has the path name here because now I can grab the artist name. Oops. Grab the artist name, copy it, paste it. I like to put a little dash in there so there's no spaces and underscore to separate the artist name and release title. And I'm going to do underscore version one. So this is going to be... And the reason I do this is because it's going to help us with our folder naming downstream. So it all kind of ties together. So that's what I would call my first render, is the Wave Labs. And sometimes you have to abbreviate long album titles, or sometimes you can dump the the. But it's the, the whole point is you, you can look at that and know what it, what it is. It's that band name, that album, and version one of it. And I'm going to render it to a folder called 96K Renders. Um, I did a whole video on rendering, but basically there's a lot of options for rendering, but you can save render presets. And my very first render preset is double zero initial montage render. And that's what I do for the initial render. Um, and what that's doing is it's choosing to render the whole montage. It's choosing to create a named file that I just named. You saw me do it. I have to manually tell it where to render it. And then part of the preset is that it created a 64-bit float, or it's going to create a 64-bit float wave and the reason for that being is that's that's the bit depth that wavelab is processing audio so even if your files come in as 24 bit or even maybe 16 the moment you start processing those files the bit depth increases the floating point and you can use wavelab's bit depth meter to see that 
Um, it's floating point audio. We're going to do there eventually, but not right now. So I'm going to render this and see if there's any questions, and hopefully it doesn't take too long. If it does, I'll stop it and remove some plugins for the sake of the video. Um, it looks like it is going to take a little while, so I can still take questions, but let me remove a few plugins that I know are heavy duty. Uh, maybe that'll speed it up. Sorry about this is one thing where doing a live video is not great, is when you have to get to the rendering. Um, that's, it's not real time, but I'm still on an Intel Mac Pro. I'm not on an M1. Um, I have an M1 laptop, and the rendering is notably faster, but for, I'm not set up to do live streams on that. So let's let this render. Uh, I know sp some people said they had a couple questions, so this could be a good break to do question and answer. And I'm not done here, um, but this is a kind of a stopping point where I rest my ears and let it render. But we still have to create, you know, I'm working at 96K. I, eventually, I will deliver 24-bit 96K masters to clients because most distributors can accept that and Bandcamp does. But, you know, initially, I don't deliver the high-res files because... Very few clients can hear those accurately. Even, you know, if they load a 96K file in iTunes, their computer is probably resampling it. I'll get to all that later, but there are some steps here yet. I just have to get the first render out of the way. Then we, then we downsample, and then we render track by track, and it all comes together nicely. You'll see that, but I think I just saw a question come in. Um, I don't use the AES naming convention because... In my opinion, it's a little long. I have a mix engineer that sends me, he he uses it. And I understand I'm all about conventions and organization. And, but in my opinion, it's pretty long. Cause like whenever I looked at, whenever I look at his mix files, I, I have to think about what am I looking at? Cause it's usually so long that it gets cut off and in, in whatever view I'm in, you know, not, I may mean, not have this view, but I'm aware of the AES naming convention. I just think it's a little bit and I appreciate how thorough it is, but I think it's, I don't use it myself. I have my own kind of system. I can show you, I just cleaned up a bunch of delivered projects. So this, that might not be good actually. Let me see if I, I may have to open up. Just last night I got rid of all the finished projects. Um, let me find an album that's done. This is my archive thing. I do believe in a system. You know, I have the artist name, the release title, the format, 16-bit 44.1, WAV files, version 2, you know, MP3s, instrumentals. I do have a very, very detailed system. I just don't, I think the AES one is a little bit long, and it also doesn't pertain necessarily to mastering i think it's more a good way of naming mixes so it's a good question but i just kind of do my own thing but i do think it's very important to be consistent because when i open a project from five years ago i know exactly what i'm looking at because i i picked i came up with the system and haven't really changed from it much so um, that is that let's see if there's any other questions Well, this render is getting close to being done, and as I mentioned, it's it's doing it's rendering the full montage in one pass. But I also I should have mentioned in the render presets, I have a bunch of presets which we'll get to eventually once I do everything. But I also forgot to show you the options tab, which is part of the presets. Um, one option is that I'm bypassing the master section. Now, in theory, there should be no difference because I'm not using the master section. But just to be safe. I bypass the master section on rendering. Now that's not the montage output that what it's referring to is this master section over here, which again, I'm not using, but just to be safe, I have it checked to bypass. Um, some other options I'm not using in this. I am using copy markers. I am using create audio montage from result, which is kind of why I started talking about this. When this render is done, it's going to create a new montage, including all the markers, all the data that I've entered. Um, so I'm basically going to have a mirror image of this montage, except 
all the processing is going to be baked in. And then that's a point where I can render my various formats. Um, open resulting audio file. I use this option when I'm rendering vinyl sides because I want it to open and I want to check it. But f I don't need to have it checked in this instance because it's going to make a whole new montage. Um, so there are some options here, but I, I, I get the feeling that not a lot of people use the render presets, but for me it's huge because there's so many little options and it's easy to miss something. Whereas if you have your render presets, everything's consistent. You don't forget anything. And if you look really closely, the zero has an underline under it. That means I can press the zero key on my keyboard and it chooses that one as a little shortcut. So maybe you didn't know that, but now you do. This render is almost done, so watch what happens. It's going to create a new montage um, with all that processing baked in. And let's, well, first first thing I do is name it. Now you can name it whatever you want. I name it the exact same thing as the source, except I change the 64 to 24 and I get rid of the little underscore at the end. And I have a stream deck thing that watch, it's going to do it for me. What the stream deck thing did is it toggled back to the source it copied the name, it changed some numbers around, and then it opens up this window to prompt me to load my dithering plugin. So as you can see, you may want to rewind that and watch it again, but look how they're named. The, almost the same name except the 24, I changed that because while the audio, is, the source audio is not 24-bit, that's what I'm going to be rendering from this montage. I'm going to be rendering 24-bit 96K WAV files. So the Stream Deck thing just names it quickly, and I can, uh, I don't have to think about it, but you can always toggle over and manually copy the name and then manually do it that way. But I like the Stream Deck for shortcut. You can also use Keyboard Maestro if you don't have a Stream Deck. I use Keyboard Maestro on my laptop setup because I'm not going to haul a Stream Deck around, but Keyboard Maestro basically gets the job done too. Uh, there's just You have to program shortcuts. There's no physical stream deck so let's check this out here you always want to check your renders to make sure your plugins behave correctly because believe it or not you know just because a plugin is working on playback doesn't mean it's going to render correctly or at all um, I, I have kind of a core group of third-party plugins that i stick to that i know work it's not unheard of to try a new plugin that just came out and it sounds fine on playback, but it has a rendering glitch or doesn't render. So you want to check your work, of course. Um, and because I know these plugins, I'm not too worried about it. But let's go to that um, transition point. The songs that overlap. I'm going to open it in the audio editor so there's no marker. Oh, well, there is a marker in the way. Let me delete it. As you can see, there's absolutely no disruption in the audio at that transition point. If I would have tried to render it track by track and then butt the files up with all that plugin processing, very good chance there's going to be a click or a pop. And you're going to drive yourself nuts trying to fix it. So that's a big reason for rendering all in one pass first. I know it seems like a lot and a little bit like a detour, but um, once I figured that out, I never looked back. And it's saved me so much time and headache because plugins like some heads up when they need to start and stop. So one long render. I, I learned this because I had a problem where there was a glitch. I was going track by track, but the DDP did not have a glitch. And what I realized is a DDP is actually one long file, one long render, and then it puts the markers in. So I said, why don't I render? So I've kind of stole it from the DDP idea. Anyways, what we have here is a great um, rendering of the montage at still at the native sample rate, 96K but all the plugin processing is baked in. Um, the only thing I really need to do here is add the dither, which I did, you know, via a preset. I like the Good Hertz Good Dither. WaveLab 11 introduced um, Steinberg's Lin Dither, which is also very good. Again, one of those things where I just haven't gotten in the habit of figuring out what, how I want to use it because I'm too busy. But um, the dither that you definitely want to put this in the montage output section. Because that, that means everything that travels, 
everything in the montage is going to travel through it. So my whole point was, let me bring up the bit depth meter. Let me remove the dither plugin. So you can see our audio is 64 bit float. Um, Cause when I rendered it, that's what I told it to be. And that's what the processing was. But when I insert the dither plugin, I'll put it back in. Now you can see we're reading 24 bit audio. So this is where you could render 24 bit 96 K wave files, which I have a preset for 24 bit wave. The sample rate doesn't matter in my preset because the preset is telling it to retain the same sample rate as the session. So I don't even have to think about that, but let's say, you know, like I mentioned, I don't really want to send my client 96 K waves right now. And I don't want to render 96 K waves of each track and then sample rate convert those. Cause you could lose some metadata errors could happen. So what I like to do is at this point in time, I'm going to open up RX and I kind of want to just prove that you can use any sample rate converter that you prefer. Some people like Weiss uh, Seracon, some people like uh, rate brain. I think there's a couple others that people like. You can, of course, use the WaveLab batch processor. But anyways, I'm going to go back and I'm going to select that full render. You know, version one of the render. And I'm going to choose my 44.1 preset. Make a new folder called 44.1k renders. And I'm going to downsample that. Now, RX has a limitation of 32-bit float, which is fine. I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. But what I'm doing is downsampling my floating point 96K render of the project down to 44.1. Which, again, I know this seems like a slight detour, but it solves so many problems, and it's the cleanest way to do it, in my opinion. So once that's finished, go back to WaveLab. And again, you'll notice when this new montage was created, all the markers carried over, all the CD text carried over. So I don't have to re-enter any of that. But what I do need to do now is make what's called a custom montage duplicate. And I use the shortcut so often that I forget how to do it the slow way, but audio, custom, uh, from current file, custom. that would be the setting you use to show you what I'm about to do. But I don't even have to go in here. I can just, I copy the name of the montage because again, that's going to come in handy. I press command and the forward slash and it brings up the same window. And I just have to point it to the folder in which, the reason I make a new folder is because these files have the same name. So obviously two files can't have the same name in the same folder. That's a problem. And there's ways to get around that with the naming thing, but I make a new, a 44.1 renders folder, point it to that. In fact, there's still something in there from before. Um, so you can get around naming discrepancies with, with this area, but normally I keep that empty. So now it's going to make a new montage using the 44.1 version. And as you can see, the CD text is still there. Um, so again, I'll toggle back to this. This one I think I do manually. I'm going to change it to 2444. Because again, the bit depth to me in the naming, the bit depth is kind of what I'm going to render, not necessarily what it is, but also it is what it is because the dither is running. So however you want to interpret that, but the 44 indicates 44.1 sample rate, digital master version one. So now we are actually ready to render 24 bit waves of each track. So again, I can choose my 24 bit wave preset. Again, this is where the naming consistency comes in handy because I can copy the name of this. You know, earlier on I, I made this naming scheme and that's kind of going to be your naming scheme for the whole record. Kind of like when I went to that finished project. Get back to it. When I went to that finished project, you'll notice that all the formats are really, they're all named the same thing, just different variations of for the numbers and things like that. So it helps. Anyways, I'm going to copy that name, paste it in the location field, and just add 2444 wave version one. Again, using the 24-bit wave tracks preset, because that's going to make 
24 bit wave files of each CD track. And I'm going to press render, which is command and enter, or you can press the start rendering button. Now you notice these renders go very fast because all the processing aside from dithering is done. So the first render takes a while. It's a good time to use the bathroom or get something to drink. Then when you come back, you can do all the downstream renders, which go very quickly. So if we go to the, back to the folder, you can see I have a nice 24-bit, 44-1 wave of each song. Um, I can also create a PDF. I have, again, many presets here, but the JP Start one creates this PDF that I saved in that folder. And this kind of, you know, so many clients don't think about titles until it's too late. I, I try everything I can do to get the correct titles ahead of time, but this kind of encourages them to look at the titles and make sure what they've sent me is how they want the song named. So, um, having a PDF, like I said, I just think that that gets them thinking about some of the administrative stuff. It'll show, if there's ISRC codes, it'll show them, uh, things like that. And that just gets put in the file in the folder. Um, if I wanted to render a DDP, I could do um, com Shift S. I would save this as 16 bit, or I'll save it as 1644, and I would insert my 16 bit dither. And now I can press Shift and DD, which is brings up the DDP rendering box. I'll show you the slow way to do it, but now I'm rendering a DDP, and you can see the the files populating. Because some people like to send out a DDP and DDP player for clients to audition their master. Uh, Steinberg even makes a free DDP player that you can send to your clients so they can listen to the DDP that you've created. And that's just a great way to um, make sure they're hearing the master accurately. They're hearing the correct spacing between songs. Um, the slow way would be, um, I don't even know the slow way. Oh yeah, it would be to go to the CD tab and click on, uh, see, I don't even do it, right, audio, CD, or DDP. Um, and that's how you get to that box. But I have it programmed, programmed as a shortcut to, to get to that. Um, if I wanted to render MP3s, um, if you watched Dan Worrell's video about bit depth, you may have reverted back to making MP3s from 16-bit audio, so I could just simply change it from that text to mp3 choose the mp3 tracks preset that i've made and now i'm rendering mp3s to their own folder that's what i love about wave lab is the ability to edit the folder name before it even gets made and then as soon as you hit render um, it's made let me back up a step though with mp3s you can even add the artwork you can do it with wave files too but very few Programs can display artwork in WAV files, although that's changing. The latest Mac OS can. But let's say here's the cover art. I'll re-render those MP3s. And now we're going to see that artwork in the MP3s. And if you were to load these into a media player, which some clients probably do, it looks pretty good. You know, it looks like an official, it looks professional. It looks presentable. It's not a mess. It's well organized. So that's part of why I get the naming thing figured out right from the start, and everything everything else falls into place. But you know, if if your client loaded this into iTunes or Windows Media Player, it looks pretty good. Um, and again, when you go back to the folder, you know that it's that band, it's that name, it's version one, and it's an MP3. Now let's say they. If they approve the master, I can go back to the 24-bit, or I can go back to the 96K version and um, render a 24-bit 96K wave of each song. It goes very quickly because, again, the processing is baked in. And now we're filling, filling up a folder of 24-bit 96K waves. And as you can see, the metadata is all present in these files, which again, comes back to entering it once and forgetting about it. With the right metadata preset, you're entering this information easily just one time and then it's all fills in downstream. Um, if I open up this DDP, 
and a player. Ooh, it didn't like that UPC for some reason. I'll have to look into that. I didn't really think about the UPC. I'm not sure why it's not liking it, but let me get rid of it. Make a new DDP. That was unexpected. So that, whether you're talking about metadata and WAV files or talking about a DDP, Wow. This is very unusual, but somewhere when I was somewhere along the line I didn't like oh the information is still there. Maybe I took it out of the wrong one. One more time. Sorry about this. One of those things that never happens in real life, but when I'm trying to do a video, sometimes I miss certain things. Let's see if it likes it now. My whole point is that you enter the information once and it's all cohesive. Yeah, so it, I don't know what was going on there, but the titles are all the same as the metadata, as, as the same as the file names. Everything's easy to look at. Now let's say the client, I wouldn't have made the high resolution waves if it wasn't approved, but let's say it was. But let's say the client does want a revision. As I mentioned, I would go back to version one and save it immediately as version two because you always want to have a backup. You always want to have a copy of a previous version, in my opinion, because you'll get yourself in trouble if you just open the previous version and start making more changes because you know what's going to happen. They're going to say, can you split the difference or it was better before? And then you actually don't know what it was before. And then you're guessing. So version two right away. And it could be something as simple as, you know, make song one, I don't know what that EQ is. It could be something as may add some low end to song number one. So we can do that. Um, you know, it could be make the sounds great, but can you make it louder? So yeah, turn the whole thing up. I'm being dr dramatic. I'm being um, extreme here for dramatic effect. It could be something like, can we add more space between songs two and three? Um, could be. It could be, um, can we fade out song two faster? And again, I want to be in ripple mode. Let's see if I am. I forgot to put it back. So ripple mode would be, you know, can we fade out song two faster? We can. And the relationship between all the files stays the same. It could be, you know, the intro of song five feels a little quiet. So you could do some volume automation to boost up the intro of song five. Any number of things. It could even be... Um, you know, we we had to send it. We had to make a new mix of one of the songs because we found a problem. So let's say, let's say, break it off. I'm just making a copy, but let's say break it off is um, they sent a mix four. Now, in some programs, this would be a total headache to to uh, put mix four into the sequence here. But with WaveLab, we can press Command R as my shortcut. The slow way is to go to Insert, Replace Audio File, and you can browse for it. But basically, what you can do here is tell WaveLab to in, uh, replace an existing file with a different one. So Mix Three A was in there. Now I'm going to um, and insert mix well, I got to do the right song break it off mix 4a we'll pop that in and now you know the mix change could be something simple as we tuned a vocal or it could be we turned up the bass so obviously sometimes you need to listen to it and make sure your settings are still correct you know if they turn up the bass guitar you may want to check some of your settings if they turned up the drums you may want to check some of your settings if it's a simple you know I've had cases where the mix had the backing vocals muted by accident anything my whole point was you can insert a new file very easily and, and without having to drag stuff around or redo any settings it's just replace audio and point it to a new file and even if only one song changes i render the whole thing again because you're going to want to know 
what was the final version of the EP? You know, you're mastering an EP or an album, you know, even though we're only changing one or two songs, render the whole thing again and repeat those steps because you're also going to ha have to make perhaps a vinyl master and you're going to need to know how was everything set when they approved it. So let's say they approved, let's say I sent out version two. I just redid all those steps, re-rendered it. They like version two. Um, if, but now we have to make a vinyl master. I would just do save as. I have a little shortcut for pasting that text. Version two, and it says vinyl pre-master. Now this is a bad example because it's got an odd number of songs, but let's say we're making the vinyl master. Let's say side B starts with song three. We use, I did a whole video on rendering vinyl sides, so you can watch that for more detail, but you can choose, you know, CD track group. It's the track groups designate the, the sides. So the first two songs are side A, second two songs are side B. Let's say we do some special vinyl settings, you know, remove the limiter, check for sibilance, that kind of thing. Let's say we love how the, we do our things to make it sound how we want for the vinyl master, which is sometimes not very much at all. Um, sometimes when you remove a limiter, um, parts become too dynamic. So maybe you want to bump up an intro for the vinyl master because the limiter isn't helping you, helping that happen. Whatever you decide, but then, you know, you'll have to watch that video, but then we can render our vinyl sides. Again, changing the folder name to vinyl version two was what it is and again i have a preset for rendering vinyl side a it has to think so get all those plugins ready vinyl side b and you can do this for cassettes and then also where i was going with this is instrumentals too so you know sometimes you have to master the instrumental versions of a record and then once it's approved, but let me finish what I'm showing you here. So I have a setting for the vinyl PDFs. Start vinyl. It just says the audio is 24-bit, 96K, one file per album side. Um, I would name that the same as this. I didn't quite do it how I normally would, but you get the idea. Um, Side A. That version one shouldn't be in there, but I was just going too fast. But side A, and then we change the track group to track group B for side B. And now what we're going to have here is a nice PDF of each side. I like to make big red text so whoever's looking at this to cut it can't miss it. But we have these PDFs that tell the cutting engineer... Um, what songs are on each side and where they start because we're making a single file for each side and you'll notice side b the pdf for it starts at zero which is where the file is going to start and uh, you can kind of see these filling up the folder for vinyl um, i don't know i saved the pdfs in the, in the wrong spot i saved i was going too fast but in theory ignore the version one because i screwed up when i was uh, naming stuff but now our vinyl folder is filling up. So my whole point here is it's when you work this way, it's very flexible to make all your derivative versions. Um, I don't have instrumentals handy, but if once the record's approved, I could save as um, and just put instrumental in the montage name and then do the replace feature I showed you where I'm literally just clicking on this file, replacing it and drop, having it put the instrumental version in instead. Um, in the case of songs that overlap, you may want to unoverlap for the instrumentals version because if someone's going to license it, they want probably a clean start and ending. But my whole point is you don't have to rebuild the montage for the, all your derivative versions. So I'm going to check for any final questions here. I know we're getting kind of long, but that's kind of in a nutshell how I would master an EP or album in, in the montage, uh, including any revisions. And then once approved... You know, your alternate formats for vinyl and cassette, instrumentals. I'm trying to think if there's any other va variations I usually do. Um, you know, sometimes songs have clean or radio edits, so 
usually that gets its own montage, but it's, it's usually not every song on the record getting a clean version. So let me check out some questions. I mean, I, I can't really say which plugins have dropouts and glitches, but if you um, experience them, you know, rendering as one long pass is an easy way to fix it. You know, I, I don't want to name any names or throw anyone under the bus, but oftentimes on the forums, I'll see, I tried to use this plugin and it has a rendering glitch and, and basically the plugin developer has to fix that or you have to find a way around it, um, things like that. So I'm not saying every plugin is going to have a problem, but it just helps mitigate any kind of rendering problems by doing everything in one long pass first before you start breaking it up track by track you know when songs when when there's silence between the songs the glitches maybe don't exist because there's silence but it can be very obvious when songs overlap and i my whole approach is i like to come up with a workflow that kind of works for every possible scenario i'm going to encounter so i don't have to troubleshoot you know this this is kind of a blanket approach that covers albums with songs that overlap and albums that don't have songs that overlap and everything in between so um and i you know i've I talked with other people that used to use uh, sequoia and soundblade and they all did the same thing where they render the whole album as one pass first it just clears up so many problems Um, the Stream Deck presets are on the WaveLab Help website. The only caveat is I think I found out that you know, I have the normal size Stream Deck with 15 buttons. If you have the bigger one or the smaller one, it's not going to translate. But if you go to wavelabhelp.com, the Stream Deck um, settings are on there. You can download the profile. I mentioned it before, but with this workflow, you know, I, I do... My analog processing first in a separate session, get things kind of on the same page and um, without any, I listen through limiting, but I don't commit to that limiting because I don't want to commit to that limiting in the analog stage because then any revisions, you're doing a lot of backtracking. So I, I monitor through some rough limiting. Uh, I did a whole video on that and then I do the final assembly in a clean montage that um, works the same way as what I just showed you, except for you wouldn't have to do as much work because you've already got things pretty much dialed in except for maybe that final limiter. So um, I break it up into two steps um, if I'm using analog gear, just so I have more flexibility. And yeah, I mean, the DDP is, even if clients aren't making CDs, I, I, I give them the option of listening to the DDP because I've had too many cases where people load the songs into iTunes and iTunes creates a problem, whether it's there's an EQ engaged or they burn a CD and it's adding space between the songs. So the DDP player, I don't even, I consider DDP more of a, an approval tool that just happens to be what CDs are made from. And I also use a player called Sampley. And it's, what it is, is it's a, it's a web player that plays lossless and gapless audio and it displays the artwork it displays the metadata that's in the file, so it looks clean. It basically looks like you're listening to a nice streaming service because you don't see the ugly file names. It, it, it extracts the metadata that's in the waves and displays that, so everything looks clean. Uh, it's, it plays in a browser So because a lot of times people don't have the patience, even though it's very simple, to install the DDP player. So this works on a phone, tablet, no install. It's just a link, and it plays gapless and lossless audio. It's sampley, so... Sampley Audio. If you just Google Sampley Audio, you'll find it. But it's basically developed with the help of some mastering engineers to get a web-based... It basically works like DDP, but it's on the web. And um, aside from any network problems, you know, it plays gapless audio. So when songs overlap, there's no hiccup. You know, there's other options, but they all have a problem of either playing low quality audio or adding space between the songs or both, or they don't look good or they don't even play to the next song. But this, this plays from song to song. It feels just like you're listening to a streaming service, except for you're not, but it's a great, another great approval tool. Um, but the big part of the job is just 
getting your clients to be able to listen to the master accurately um, so they're not chasing problems that don't even exist. And I think I forgot to, my whole point about that is, yeah, I mean, if you just get get everything named correctly up front, it saves you so much time later. Now, sometimes clients will change a name of a song and it's a little bit extra work or you can, of course, change, if, if I go back to my montage, you can change the song order by dragging clips around in the list or even in the CD tab, you can drag stuff around and you got to do some cleanup work. Um, it's going to yell at me for something or other here, but I think it's because stuff is touching, but um, you can drag stuff around in the CD tab or the clips tab. You just have to clean up your markers and spacing. But the other thing I was going to talk about earlier on is that I see a lot of people do markers like this. Well, they don't use splice markers. And then you get an end marker and a start marker. I'm not saying that's a problem, but it's a, it's a potential hazard because if you're not careful and you just render this track, track one, and then render track two, you're going to be miss without the right settings, you're going to be missing that audio. And then when you submit that to streaming, these songs, this selected audio is not going to be present in any file. So then the songs are going to play too quickly back to back. Now there is an option to include, um, let me, option to include the pause before or after the track, but you have to select one of those two and it's easy to miss. So that's why I just use the splice markers because that just means one track ends, the next one starts at the same time. No gray area, no confusion um, by using the end and start marker, you know, um, separated like that. I just think that's a recipe for something to go wrong. And you can convert marker types, you know, you could delete all your end markers and make that one a splice marker. Um, but there is a reason why the splice markers exist. It just keep, keeps things cleaner, in my opinion. Um, checking out another question. Yeah, I mean, the, the full render does take a little bit of time, but it, um, I find that there might be ways to get around redoing the full render, but then you're playing around with inserting stuff and then that's a potential for a human error. And by the time you screw around with that and then check it and then render it, you, it's not really much of a time saver. And then as I mentioned, it's easy to get lost, you know, cause what if they like some changes, but not the other changes, um, then you're really creating a potential mess for yourself. So I just, you know, I just keep it really simple version, version two, version three, and just re-render the whole thing. Cause then when the project is approved and you have to go make the vinyl master, you don't have to, you know, again, double check which versions were the finals and then put those in the vinyl sequence and it, it can get too messy. So I just decided, yes, the rendering takes a bit longer, even if it's a minor change, but the time it saves you overall and the, the, the chances for error that eliminates are just worth it. I mean, I can usually... When something's rendering, I usually have an email to respond to or something to do anyway. So it's not that big of a deal, in my opinion, to, to re-render the whole thing. But that's a personal choice. If you want to find a way to get around that, that's there's no there's no rules. But um, I just found it. I thought about it, and I found it to be more trouble than it's worth. Oh, the logo on the PQ sheet. That's a good question. Let me go back to that. I have to find one that is valid because I, sc I screwed this one up. So the PQ report, again, even if clients aren't making CDs, I still make these, but let me go back to my starting point. It's called header image. So I just have this logo saved in my Dropbox, which is kind of nice because then if I'm on my laptop, it it finds it there too. But you just choose the header image option and... You know, I think years ago it just had a default generic CD as the starting point, but you can choose any image you want, really. There's some uh, some rules you want to pay attention to, but you can have it be in the center, and you can play with some settings, but when you press OK, 
I'll just do it to the desktop so I can delete it later. Um, it does put your studio logo. It tells you, you know, the name of the montage, number of tracks, all the basic stuff you'd want to know. But yeah, it does allow you to put a logo up there if you want to. I, I don't know if it does color. It probably does color logo too, but I just stick to black and white. Well, it looks like that's all the questions, and um, unless any more. Uh, video, I don't do any video work, so I haven't explored any of the recent video editions, but WaveLab does have video tracks now, picture tracks. Um, in my line of work, I just don't um, use them. I think when WaveLab 11 came out, Ian, um, Ian Stewart did a, a handful of wave lab 11 videos and he may have touched on that so if you search youtube for wave lab 11 and ian stewart he might have touched on some of the video stuff but yeah you can load in a video and and um touch up the audio and then create a new video file with a fixed audio i mean wave lab is not a video editor but it has some basic stuff like that if you do work with video So, yeah, like I was saying, this is more of a, a live freestyle kind of thing, and hopefully I covered everything um, in a nutshell for, for doing EPs and albums. If there are any final questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, we're going on two hours here, so it's probably a good time to sort of wrap it up. And if I did forget anything, I can do a second video. Feel free to ask questions in the WaveLab users group on Facebook or... Um, you can send me a message at wavelabhelp.com. Um, the Steinberg WaveLab forum is also um, very good. Um, PG or, or um, Philip, who created WaveLab actually and still develops it, he's very active on the WaveLab forum. So you can't really get more direct from, than the, the guy that made it and still develops it. So he that's a good resource as well as the WaveLab forum, especially if you find any problems or have any feature requests that's a great place to do it because you get right to the to the person doing it um, i don't use the watch folders um, when when ian and i did the batch processor video which you can find on wave lab help we did demonstrate the watch folders i just personally don't have a use for them um, I mean, if i was in broadcast um, i guess you could use the watch folders to automatically upsample new files you get to master and put them somewhere but for those that don't know, watch folders are basically, you can kind of set up a batch process, you know, say I want to upsample and then normalize and then change the bit depth and name it this way. You can have a watch folder, which is just a folder on your, you know, any folder in your computer system. And uh, when new files are in that folder, WaveLab is watching the folder, which is why it's named that. And then automatically processes those files. I, I can imagine it would be good for people in broadcast that are dealing with long files, long renders, stuff coming in overnight, um, things like that. But I don't, I don't personally use the watch folders, but if you want to watch the batch processor video from about a year ago, I want to say, um, you know, we, we, we touched on how to use the watch folders. I'm reading um, Coast Mastering's question. I don't quite understand it, though. If there's a way to universally disable sequential key commands. Um, you may have to email me about that. Um, for those that don't know, um, if you go in the preferences area, the shortcuts, you know, you can program your own key commands. So let me just, let me just type something generic, uh, montage. You know, you can... Find anything that's programmable and then assign your own key command to do it. I'm not quite sure what the question is asking, though. Um, so that could be a good one for PG on the forum, or just if you want to send me an email, explain it more. But I, I honestly don't know um, how to answer that. Well, all right, it is, it's 5 o'clock my time, 6 o'clock Eastern. We're going to wrap it up, but thanks for watching. Um, next week, or sorry, next month, I know I said we're going to have an interview. Um, we had some scheduling conflicts, so the interview 
edition, the next interview edition is going to be in September. Um, and that will be announced soon with, with a prominent wave lab user. And as always, thanks for listening, watching, if you're watching live or later and click some of the links in the notes to, you know, get to some of these websites I've been talking about and hopefully you learn something.